Hey, what's up Alphas? Anshul here from Alpha Code. Finally, the next video is here and from now on it should be a smooth ride. So let's talk a bit about monoliths. For those of you who are coming here from my blog, I guess you will be already familiar with this stuff. So it's not necessary for you guys to watch it, but still feel free because this will be a little more in depth as compared to my blog. But still, I'm not going to spend too much time on monoliths because if you are coming into microservices architecture, I'm pretty sure you know the disadvantages of your current architecture. Right, so here is a problem statement and using this statement, I will show you what a monolith is and how does it differ from a microservice. So your task is to develop a server side enterprise application. Now, I have not told you what kind of application it is. It can be an e-commerce application. It can be something like for taxi booking. It can be a new searching backend. It can be a backend for Twitter, for Facebook, whatever you want to implement. That's fine with me. It's not going to make much of a difference. There are a few key considerations. One is that it must support a variety of different clients, including desktop browsers, mobile browsers, and native mobile applications. It might also integrate with other applications via either web services or via message broker like payment gateways and notification services, right? So if you have implemented your own backend at any point of time, you must have integrated it with any third party system whose services you might be using. Now your application backend handles requests by executing business logic, accessing a database or exchanging messages with other systems and returning a JSON in response. Pretty straightforward, right? So what does a typical backend of this sort looks like? You first create a project. It might be a Node.js project. You will have certain dependencies which will be packaged within your application. And if it is Java, you will have a POM or a Gradle where you will have dependencies inside them. And then those will be packaged into your jar file or war file. And then you will create multiple packages. Each of those will have your corresponding logic, right? So it might look something like this. So this is a typical backend application. And this is an example of an e-commerce server side app. You will have some controllers which handles your API requests and your API requests might be from a desktop, from a mobile phone or any other medium. That shouldn't matter to you. It can be a postman or it can be a third party server side client. Right. So similarly, you will have services which your controllers will pass in your request to your services and services will have all the business logic and then they will fetch the data from your DAOs and DAO layer is a very dumb layer which will just fetch the data from your database, maybe using a repository and then create some entity objects and send it to your service and your services will communicate with each other and return the data using your controllers. In a very similar way, suppose you have a taxi booking server side app, which might look something like this. So this is an example taken straight from Chris Richardson's book. You might see this example somewhere else mentioned as Uber's backend architecture, but it's not, but it's very similar to Uber, right? So this will be the first version of your application. Your app will have an hexagonal architecture. The internal modules will have something like this. You will have different modules for billing, for passenger management, for notifications, for payments and things like that. Similarly, you will have some services which is coordinating from outside world using adapters. So adapter is just a fancy term. This is the conversion layer which is talking to the outside world and converting that response for your use. So you will be accessing your DBs, some of your third party servers like for sending OTPs and emails for payment gateways and then you will have web UI which is using your APIs to serve the content to your web front-end traffic. And then you might have your driver app and passenger app, which is using your REST APIs directly, right? So this is all the outside world that you are interacting with using your app. This is basically a monolith because all of your business logic resides within single application and you only have one database. So although your architecture is modular, you can see the modular architecture here. Similarly, you have a very modular architecture here as well. The application is packaged and deployed as a single monolith, meaning one big file, right? And the deployment format depends on applications language or framework. Like for example, many Java applications might be packaged as war files and deployed on application servers like Tomcat, Jetty or something like that. 
and other Java applications might be self-contained executable jars, also known as fat jars. That might be a simple Java application or maybe a Spring Boot jar. And similarly, if you are using .NET, you will have something like .exe or .dll or .msn. If you are using Ruby on Rails or Node.js, you might have a packaged directory hierarchy, right? And you might zip that and deploy onto your server. The advantages of this kind of architectures are many. One is that it is very simple to develop. It is very simple to deploy, right? You only have one file. You will take that file and deploy onto your server. And that's it. It is very simple to manage because you only have to take care of one simple project. It's easy to comprehend because all of the things are there within one project. It's very easy to understand all the packages and you don't have any dependencies, only one database. So very easy to grasp, right? And it is very simple to test. You just have one jar, give it to one of your testers. You have some predefined APIs and you just call this service and you are done because it only takes seconds to bring this up. And it's very easy to scale this up as well well up to a certain level and how do you scale it you just run multiple copies of it whenever you have high level of traffic and you run only couple of copies if you have low level of traffic and that too you need two copies at least because if one of them goes down you still want to serve the traffic so you have one for fail safe purposes right so now you'll say this looks awesome <laughs> why would we ever want to move away from this architecture now there are plenty of disadvantages with this architecture as you will see after a certain point of time. Let's talk about how successful applications grow over time. And when I talk about successful applications that might be what your WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Uber, Netflix, Airbnb. All of these companies have actually pioneered microservices architecture and they were all using a monolithic architecture at some point of time in their career. So let's see why did they move on from monolithic architecture to microservices architecture and we have not talked about microservices architecture as of now so just think of it as something that is solution to monoliths right so your first version will look something like this it will be awesome you will have all the features you will nicely package it and deploy it right second version you will add few more features and it will look something like this third version will look something like this and fourth version which looks something like this and your current version if you have a successful applications and you have been working on it for many years it will look something like this and it actually does it's not a joke in fact i worked for a company long time ago whose application took 15 to 20 minutes just to come up so you can understand the size of code base they were having in their monolith right so let's talk about disadvantages of monoliths this is one of the main ones so you have a language framework lock. That means whenever your monolith is created, you might have chosen the best framework that you have at that point of time. But with time, after four or five years, now your application has grown so big. Even if you have new languages or frameworks in the market, which you might want to move to because they suit your architecture very well, you cannot move because the size of the application is so big, it might take years for you to implement all of that logic again. And you start lacking innovation because either you are too caught up managing such a big system or you always feel something might break up in someone else's code whenever you try to change something at one part of the code. And it's all mixed up. You have shared libraries, you have shared databases and it's really tedious to move on to a new framework. It's very difficult to digest for even an experienced person who might have been working on the same code base for years, he might also forget parts of it. So it's never easy. It's very difficult to distribute development. It requires a lot of coordination and people are always scared because parts of module are not autonomous. They all have dependencies within each other. So if you want to change a library version in this module, it might break up something else in some other module because it is also using the same library. Also, whenever you change something and you submit it to the server, you always end up with so many conflicts in Git and half of your time is spent resolving all those conflicts. Now, do you have bug in any module? You will need to deploy the whole unit which might not be feasible. So what you do, you wait for significant number of changes to deploy and so monoliths becomes obstacle to frequent deployments 
So instead of deploying small changes frequently, you are deploying large changes infrequently, which increases the probability of things going wrong in production, right? Releases might take months in some cases. Development slows down. And this is really, really an issue. When I worked for that company whose code used to take minutes to come up, they had almost 55,000 classes and tons of libraries being used. Their code was in GBs. Even if you change a variable's value, first you will have to build it, which will take 10 minutes. Then you will have to bring it up. That will take another 10 minutes. So everything slows down. ID slows down, in fact. And whenever something slows down, all the estimates that you have given for someone goes down the wire. Next, your resources are not optimized. And this is one of the biggest issues. So take this for example. Suppose you have an image processing task in one of your APIs, which requires very high memory. And you have another task which requires very high IO. And you have one more task which requires very high CPU time. How are you going to pick a hardware to deploy this application? If suppose you are using Amazon EC2, you will have some servers which are CPU optimized, some are memory optimized and some are I optimized. Which one will you pick? Of course, you will go with an average one and all of your endpoints will suffer. Another problem is if one endpoint is taking time to load, another endpoints will also suffer because number of threads are limited. So suppose you are getting 100 concurrent calls on one method, which is going to take one second each, your 100 threads will be blocked on that API and your other endpoints will suffer because you don't have threads to serve to other endpoints which might only take milliseconds of time. Of course, this is not a problem if the time taken by that endpoint is due to IO operations and you are using reactive programming, something like Node.js or Spring 5 or Spring Boot 2. But if your monolith is not reactive, slowness of one endpoint will affect other endpoints as well. And the scaling becomes difficult. Now, you can't react to changes faster in auto scaling, right? So what is auto scaling? So suppose you are getting too many requests on one endpoint and at some point of time, your system will determine that this endpoint is not able to handle these many requests. I should create one more instance of this service. And if that service takes minutes to come up, of course, you won't be able to handle the load and some customers will face slowness issues. And also whole new instance of your application is deployed, even though only a part of your application might have high load, right? It's like having a buffet where you have one item which is getting very popular and people are in line for that item. But instead of increasing the number of counters for that particular item, you are setting up a whole new buffet somewhere else, which is not very efficient, of course, right? So to summarize, you have a successful business critical application that has grown into monstrous monolith that a very few, if any developers understand. And it is written using obsolete, unproductive technology that makes hiring talented developers very difficult because no one wants to work on a monolith, right? And the application is difficult to scale and is unreliable and your customers are frustrated and your operations management is also frustrated they are always finding the owner of the particular module whenever something breaks because it's really difficult to pinpoint for them which module is taking the hit and who is the owner of that module so there are all sorts of problems with monoliths in our next lecture we will see what microservices are and how they solve all of these problems although they are not free lunch so if you like this video please press thumbs up please share the love of learning thank you